welcome back to another episode of the hardcore casual with you boy base the kid as always like and subscribe but look i've got quite a few things to talk about don't want to take up too much time so let's get this rolling so while we knew probably what a week two weeks ago that ben whitaker was going to be signing to boxer it was made official i believe it was yesterday and it's a very good move for Sky if we're going to be real. But I guess what was the more surprising thing about that is he's now going to be trained by Sugar Hill Stewart as his, you know, main trainer. What do I think about this? Initially, you would think that star-wise, it's not... You would think it's not necessarily the, the perfect fit because... You know, Ben is more of a sort of a pure boxer, slick mover, you know, sort of in and out, quick footwork, you know, you know, quick angles, like nice pivots. So you would think, okay, someone that sort of gives you that, you know, that sort of ramrod jab, you know, that straight right hand, you know, training for the knockout kind of style. It, it, you wouldn't think it was a, a, a natural fit, but then you look at well Tyson Fury came from a pure boxer type background and now has almost become a puncher uh, a very credible puncher and you say okay it makes sense in the terms of well better you get someone like that training you from now so while you are a pure boxer you understand what it's like to have to use those doghouse tactics if need be you know those rough house you know th those rough house fights whereby you're not gonna always be able to you know look pretty you know a la the you know josh kelly and what happened with that situation so yeah personally i actually think it's a it, it makes a lot of sense even if you don't stay with him like full time like if you if you've already got the other fundamentals down training for those KOs now is definitely gonna improve your overall game so yeah personally i think that's a great move now if we're talking about the whole move to boxer there's no way that can be a bad thing um you know they've got a small state they got a small stable at the moment definitely would be someone that you you know you get pushed um you will be one of their you know one of their stars they're gonna have you know loads of hope content around you around the football and everything else but this is definitely one of the ones where I feel like Matchroom should have just paid the money because look, it, it, is, it is potential, you know, so you don't, you can't, you know, guarantee that he'll bring in the subscribers, whatnot, but he just looks like a talent, you know what I mean? Like, you know, some people just kind of have that look of look, win, lose or draw, you can get eyeballs on you, so there was well, there were six Olympians from the UK, and Matchroom got one in Galau Yafai, and this guy got the other five. You know, Art and Stall, Price, Fra uh, Fraser Clark, Caroline Dubois, and now you know with Ben Whitaker. It's you say to yourself, I don't know how you let all of the Olympians go to to one of your competitors. Definitely when it comes to the UK, like let's not talk about the global stable because like Matchroom's stable is stats in pretty much every territory that they're in. But the UK one is starting to slip. And the issue is now gonna be when you've got to the end of Anthony Joshua, who's obviously coming towards the end of his cycle, Dillian White. Like obviously he didn't necessarily have Kel, but he was there and then he's bounced. Um, even to a lesser degree, like Joshua Boatsy and Craig Richards, you know, Callum Smith, like all of these guys are like 30 plus. Yeah, you might have got four or five years left, but there's no, there's not a huge amount of fresh blood within the glamour division, so to speak, or, you know, the ones that we care about. Now, Fraser Clark totally made sense. Didn't need him. Um, you know, even Art and Storm Price, I mean, it probably would have made sense for them to go to Matchroom because all the belts are kind of within the weight classes they're going to be competing. So it makes sense for you to build that up, but whatever. 
But I definitely think that Caroline Dubois, Galalia Fire, and Ben Whitaker should have been like matchroom people, if I'm gonna be real. But look, this is that's a topic for another for another day, realistically. Um, Boxer are doing their thing right now, they're moving, you know, sort of they're creating and building a legacy. Sometimes you can't let the the little player like you know just walk away in the background you gotta you gotta do a couple power moves and keep them down if you really want to maintain the dominance but what do i know i mean i'm uh this isn't you know this isn't a, a pro matchroom channel as such I, I like watching good quality stuff so if sky are gonna deliver me more content and better undercards and whatnot all good but yeah in terms of um ben Whitaker and all that it was a good move um and finally obviously it's out there the training situation is going to be quite quite interested and he i think is supposed to be coming for his debut in july so i'm looking forward to it so roll on the fun times so following on from the weekend just gone uh, with dimitri bivol's very emphatic um victory over canelo alvarez the fallout from that is a bit mad First of all, you've got a bunch of people almost calling, you know, Canelo overrated for losing a fight against a guy that was naturally bigger than him. And he got, I don't want to say dominated, that's not the right word. He was beaten comprehensively but it wasn't like some mad domination you know it, it was still a fairly competitive fight but he he looked like he just ran out of gas from the fourth round onwards and was literally just like surviving on instinct and pure skill alone at the time it happens but you know you dared to be great and you know may came up short this time but you gotta run it back but when you see people oh like he's 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 nothing special or he's been exposed or it's like no you because when is when it comes to 168 like he ran through pretty much everyone at 160 minus Golovkin like he ran through everyone and even you know Golovkin he made the necessary adjustments I think the only issue with Canelo is just that he fell in love with the power a bit too much and wasn't um focused on the rest of his game and sometimes you end up losing a bit of your self when you just start getting you know comfortable with one specific aspect of your game and you're not working on everything else fundamentally you know he used to be a fairly good mover he used to be a fairly good mover i should say um he you know he had a good jab he was you know hooks was obviously his thing but he set he used to set bigger traps now he's you know every, the tactic is literally like you know pressure you know pressuring you with that educated high guard but he just found on this one occasion like he wasn't able to just walk forward on his opponent like he had to he would have needed to find some angles in he would have needed to set his traps and he just wasn't able to do it so you know it is what it is but I want to talk more about Dimitri Bivol on this point because I don't necessarily think that he's messed anything up for Canelo or Eddie Hearn or Matt Drew because he signed to them. So whatever happens, like his stock has just risen like exponentially. And there was the rematch clause, and he said that yo, let's okay, you know, I'll come down to 168 because I want to be undisputed. So I'll fight you for your belts. Now, we haven't heard anything yet as to whether or not that will or won't take place. But I've said before on a couple other channels in the comments, and I will quite happily say right now, if I was Canelo, I'd do the fight at 168. I'll, I'll take the, the advantages that I can get against this naturally bigger guy at this point. But what I would do, I want to start off my light heavyweight campaign, right? So, okay, it was unsuccessful on the first try. So do it at 168, 
put all, put my undisputed on the line. If I really think I can beat you, okay, you can come down to my weight class. I'll put all my belts on the line, but I will sanction the WBA to put the 175 title on the line as well. A la um, Leo Santa Cruz and Javante Tank Davis 2020 um, when it was behind closed doors and, you know, they had the 130... 130 super championship on the line and they also had the 135 regular belt on the line that Javante Davis was holding for the WBA quite frankly I think the WBA would sanction it because fees <laughs> I don't think any of the other sanctioning bodies would have an issue with it at that particular time obviously the WBO might make you do a show cause letter afterwards to confirm which weight class you're going to compete in but that's what I would do, put all the belts on the line so both of us have now got something to lose which makes the fight even bigger and at that point if you if Canelo were to win then he's got his light heavyweight strap that he's after and you can still then you know wait for the winner of Joe Smith Jr and Artur Baturbiev you won't probably get them straight away because at that point they might have to do a mandatory maybe against Anthony Yard or someone else so you then take your time you have your September fight you relax up until March next year and then you can look at possibly going full undisputed with the other person who's now got the other three belts whoever that might be to me that makes the most sense um, if it were to happen that way now on Bivol's side I just like the gangster. My guy's like, okay, you think that I'm too big? Cool, I'll come down to your weight class. I'll take your belts. You wanted to take mine, now I'll take yours. I beat you once, like I could do it again quite calm. Like the move is just this is why I rate I've always rated Dimitri Bivol, because he you can tell he didn't care about oh, a payday or whatever. He just wanted to prove against the best in the world like that's all he wanted was opportunity against the best and he got it and he made the most of it you know it's not a, a Caleb Plant it's not a you know a Callum Smith maybe a Billy Joe Saunders who possibly didn't believe really that they could they could win the fight so it's about what's the biggest payday I just want to be treated fair he took b-side on everything he walked to the ring first as a champion I mean it is possible to do but like you know normally that's supposed to be sacrilege apparently he took like two two million dollars or something whereas Danny Jacobs took 12 and a half like you know Callum uh Caleb Plant I think took 10 Callum Smith was something like four or five you know Billy Joe Saunders I think was about eight you know he took two he said that the money I don't care about the money right now just give me Canelo gangster Gotta got rate that. So I'm still, I'm gonna be real keen to see what happens between both of them moving forward. But I definitely don't agree with any narrative that you know Canelo is you know overrated or whatever. That you just came up against the bigger guy who was just as good. You know, maybe you can make adjustments on the next one. But right now, just gotta lick those wounds and you know go again and see what happens. Now you know what? While I'm here, let me address something else real quick. So, based on what happened with Canelo and Bivol over the weekend, now I don't have the full list in front of me, but the pound for pound list has now been updated by both ESPN and Mike Coppinger, and I think the Ring magazine has also um, adjusted their one. So, with ESPN and Mike Coppinger, they've got Terence Crawford as number one, now that Canelo's lost. Okay, cool. That's why I ain't got really an issue with that. However, the issue I do have, ESPN have got Tyson Fury at number five. They've also got Errol Spence Jr. at number three. Um, what has either of them done to be that high on the pound for pound list? All right, let's take Fury for instance. Now, forget hating or anything like that. So he's supposedly retired now, yeah? So why is he on a pound for pound list if he's an inactive fighter that's not fighting anymore? That's the first thing. He, he's said in his interviews, he's retired. So for all intents and purposes, he's retired. Therefore, he shouldn't be on a pound for pound list. That's the first thing. 
But outside of that, let's look at Tyson Fury being above Alexander Usyk in two separate pound-for-pound -pound discussions. Now, Alexander Usyk is the literal definition of what pound-for-pound -pound is. If the smaller guy were to fight the natural heavyweight, who would win? Like, what is does his skills translate to a heavyweight endeavor? Like, if you put two guys together, irrespective of size, like, does the smaller guy's skill stack up to that of the heavyweight? Because realistically, a heavyweight is always going to win a fight based on just being naturally bigger. That's kind of, you know, the premise of what the pound for pound is. So if size was not an issue, who's the better, who's the better fighter? Who would win? Well, Alexander Usyk's already proved that. He came up from a naturally smaller division cleared out a division on the road to win every single belt that he, he's ever won and then beat the unified three belt heavyweight champion on the road again. Tyson Fury has not done that. So how, and he shouldn't be on there anyway, just due to heavyweight politics personally. But okay, let's take that aside for the moment. Errol Spence Jr. How can Errol Spence Jr. be number three in a pound for pound list? when he's only campaigned in one division. Now, if you want to say, okay, yeah, he's clearing out his division, cool, fair. You can say that you don't have to always do weight jumps and whatever to, to be considered, but he hasn't, he hasn't cleared out his division yet. Six years later, like there's still work to be done. He hasn't fought, you know, a murderer's role or like the best of the best or the you know the the most high profile names or whatever so what are we judging it on you clearly aren't judging it on accomplishments because everything that he's done Alexander Usyk's done twofold plus he's gone on okay so Errol Spence went on the road to fight Kell Brook to win his first title Alexander Usyk went on the road to win every title in two different weight divisions and is also still undefeated against much higher level competition than who Errol, than Errol Spence has faced. So that aside, you, you've got him like as free, which makes absolutely no sense. Regardless of whether you're trying to push a whole Crawford Spence thing undefeated, that, that doesn't allow you to rewrite history. It doesn't. Then you've got, you've moved Canelo from number one to what was it? I think it was number four in, in those. <sighs> Off of a loss against like, you chasing greatness and that and that's what you get. Which is why a lot of people aren't taking the fights they need to be taking because this is what happens. You get you get ridiculed for a loss and it's not even like you got beat up against someone in one of your natural like you've everyone knows that you don't belong at 175 like you had to go up there to find challenges because everyone underneath you is just not doing their job i don't want to talk about pound for this too much but yeah errol spence at number three no nah. canelo dropping to number four or number five in some cases <sighs> i mean yeah yeah, I want to stop people from actually taking like the fights we want to see them take because if this is how you're going to treat them, there's but there's obviously a bunch of people in there that don't get spoken about. That. There's no, you know, there's no Ioka, Kazuto Ioka in there. You've got Estrada in there. He hasn't fought in over a year. He's not even a unified champion anymore. He's got one belt. Like, what's his credentials to be in there over who? When everyone knows that Chocolatito beat him. It, yeah look <laughs> let me let me leave it there that's that's a whole nother discussion for a whole nother time i don't have the energy i've got other things to do but look thanks for watching and leave yours in the comments down below we'll get you know we'll get into it and i might do a, a, a follow-up on sunday but for now hardcore casual out